Hello everyone, and welcome to our webcast, The Four C's of Effective Communication. I'd like to start with a few introductions today. Our first speaker is Lan Silverstone, president of Universal Data Models, Inc. And as a side note, Sandhill is now partnering with Lan and Universal Data Models. Lan is a best-selling author, consultant, and speaker with over 30 years of experience integrating organizations' information, systems, and people, and is well known for his data model resource book series, volumes one, two, and three, which describe hundreds of reusable data models. In addition, Len is also known for his universal data models. These reusable data models help to develop higher quality data models in less time. We are pleased to announce that Len has now created Universal Business Glossaries as a follow-on to Universal Data Models, and in part we'll be talking about the benefits these provide in today's webcast. Our second speaker is Jeff Giles. Jeff is Sandhills Enterprise Architect and has been a long-time Enterprise Architect, Data Governance Specialist, and he's been addressing the issues of the convergence of data modeling, business glossaries, and data governance during the past several years. You are, of course, listening to Robert Ludden, Vice President, Santel Consultants. Before we begin, in times like these, we wanted to share with you a common philosophy that Len and Santel believe in. We believe in four things that are really critically important, especially in these times of the coronavirus. One of the things that's going on that's maybe even a bigger disease than the coronavirus is panic and that's understandable what with all the terrible things going on but if we're able to stay calm through this pandemic as well as when we do work calmness leads to tremendous productivity second is aware hey what's going on what's the most appropriate thing to do third is community so we'd like to thank you for joining us today and we really, we really appreciate connecting with you. And we're going to be talking about communication, which is really about connecting in and being in sync with each other. And fourth, let's have some fun. Uh, let's have some fun during this time. Let's enjoy this time. So these are our key philosophies. When we started developing these series of webcasts, we wanted to identify and clarify our intentions these webcasts. First, we wanted to offer you real value in our presentations. The most important point of developing strong and well-defined business terms has never been more important than it is in today's era. We would like to provide you some guidance on how to provide clear, consistent, concise, and contextual communications that provide business value. Second, is our intent to change and improve how organizations go by creating and improving business glossaries. And third, we're looking for you and for your engagement both during and afterwards and welcome your feedback on our concepts. So let me tell you the story so far. This is not our first webcast in this area. In fact, over the past six months, we've talked about why organizations need a business glossary now, how to enhance communication and productivity, and building a solid foundation for data catalog. If you're interested, you can visit our YouTube channel at Sandal Consultants. As this presentation is about the four C's of effective communication, we'd like to start out by our definition of the four C's of effective communication. What do we mean by clear? You have a definition that distinctly captures the essence of the term and its meaning so that it is well understood. What do we mean by concise? Your definition is brief and to the point and does not include any extraneous information that does not hold any value. What do we mean by consistent? You have a standard and repeatable way of creating and structuring your business term glossary and common vocabulary that is used, thus minimizing ambiguity and inconsistencies. And finally, what do we mean by context? Context is everything. 
And the most important part of all, context is all about understanding by evaluating the circumstances that surround it, i.e. what are the contexts that surround the term you're defining. And with that, we're going to start with our, a quick uh, poll to get our pulse on the audience. And you should see a uh, poll in process. Uh, Jeff, can you just confirm that you're seeing this process, this poll, Jeff and Len? Yes, Robert, I can uh, see the poll. <clears throat> yes, I can see Great. the poll. And we're getting some feedback coming in. Uh, the poll is obviously in your organization, is there a common vocabulary that follow the four C's? So um, there's only so much space we can put in this poll, but obviously, you know, uh, please select your appropriate uh, particular option there. So uh, I still see some moving about there. So, and again, we appreciate everyone's feedback. Uh, in this endeavor, and uh, I'll let it uh, give another feedback, and then I'll, I'll show this poll. So let me give it another second or two. We just see, uh, I think it's pretty much stayed uh, now there for the last couple of seconds. So I'm just going to close this poll, and then I'm going to share this poll. So uh, Len, uh, Jeff, what are you guys, what are you guys seeing so far? Well, interesting that over 80%, there's either only on some terms, 50%, and generally not a lot of common vocabulary. This is what I'm finding with companies all over the world, that this issue on common vocabulary is rare. Uh, I'm actually surprised that we have even 18% of people saying, wow, uh, way to go if you're uh, able to get a clear vocabulary on almost all business terms. That's really quite outstanding. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, quite interesting to see that uh, the common vocabulary part, well, it's about a third, uh, that's not too bad. At least there's some, some focus on it. Well, great. So in today's presentation, we're gonna be speaking in more detail about the four C's of effective communication and how it can be used uh, in creating business terms in a business glossary. We'll then do a quick review of how technology can also be used to manage these business terms. So with that, let me pass it over to Len and uh, have you kick it off, Len. Great. Are you able to share my screen now? Let's see, um, I'm hitting the share screen. Uh, hold on a minute, let me just uh, make sure I close my uh, poll. There we go. So I, the poll was still showing. So you should be able to share your screen now and we are seeing your screen lens. So off to the races. Great. Great. So what I'd like to do is give an overview of communications, quick overview, and then talk about these four C's, in particular in how they relate to business glossary. So the big thing with communication is it's kind of like the Tower of Babel. Do we really have a common vocabulary? 83% of you have said, well, maybe some terms, but certainly there's an issue about getting this common vocabulary of terms to use across organizations. So I go into help, a lot of healthcare companies and this confusion when people say member and patient. As a matter of fact, a lot of times people use them in, um, uh, uh, intertwined between the two of them without discerning what's the difference between a member, which is really somebody who has insurance, and a patient, which is someone who actually has the health care, and a subscriber, which is usually the, per the employee that's allowed to get health insurance, and the insured party, which by the way could also be an organization. A lot of confusion in most healthcare companies about very basic terms in financial accounting. There's a lot of confusion in most of our financial investment organizations between portfolio and account. And the interesting thing is, is that uh, when I've used these terms, people also use them interchangeably and people mean different things when they say portfolio or account or in manufacturing. Uh, the difference between parts and products is a finished part, a completed part. Is that a product or is the product the offering? A lot of confusion uh, also with uh, BOM, Bill of Materials, uh, there's several Bill of Materials, and these are core concepts, and what I find is not only these industries, but many other industries, 
this confusion um, leads to um, lack of communication. And communication comes from the Latin communicatium, which basically means a making common, just like community, communication. Um, uh, what we're doing is connecting, which uh, that's what we're doing in the seminar is connecting and saying, hey, let's communicate in a way we are in sync. And by the way, uh, as we're connecting on this um, on this webinar, we can make an interactive. And if you have uh, if you have comments, uh, please feel free to chat in and ask comments and uh, ask questions. And let's let's communicate in this webinar. Now, what often happens in communication is there's four places where there's a huge disconnect. And this is according to a famous model. Uh, it's called Burlow's SMCR, SMCR model of communication, where there's four things that can happen. The first is someone has an intent. For instance, my intention today is to just share what I hope is going to be useful information on how to communicate, especially in a business glossary. And then I say stuff. <laughs> so there could be a gap between my intention and the stuff I'm saying, and you might say, well, Len, you didn't say anything useful. And <laughs> uh, so there could be a gap just on my side. But then the third piece is I'm saying stuff and then you receive it, maybe or maybe not. And statistics show that actually people that communicate, very small percentage of what I'm communicating is often received. There's statistics saying that the average person loses their attention every 17 seconds, every 17 seconds, or six times a minute is another study. So very often what I'm saying is often not received well. And then even if it is received, there's something about the human mind that jumps to stories, opinions, judgments, perceptions, and makes something of it. And we all have this. We all have these filters. So this gets complicated further in the business glossary because I've just used hundreds of words. And every one of those words can be magnified and we come into this big gap. And this gap results in this idea of lost productivity, uh, of lost service, of lost dollars. Um, so what I like to do is talk about the four C's in regard to the business glossary. The first C is clear. Now, of course, we want these definitions to be clear, but there's so many gaps that I've seen all over the world, world, even defining simple things like a customer or an invoice or an order or the things that I said before, a portfolio. And very often people will look it up even on uh, uh, Wikipedia or uh, Webster's Dictionary or industry models, but there's still this confusion. And the reason is, is that there's there's so many issues about defining each of these terms with real clarity meaning that there is a key discernment that you say hey this is exactly what this is now you say well everybody knows what a customer is well not so is a prospect a customer and by the way this varies according to organizations uh, i had one client that basically said oh we have seven thousand customers and by the way, this person got fired from their company because after they did a whole bunch of data quality and data cleanup, uh, we they and they realized, well, prospects are not customers, they're prospects. They're not people that have bought things. Well, the company was saying, well, we have 30,000 customers. And um, the company didn't like that this person was saying, no, we have 7,000 customers according to what our definition of customers. So this could create create havoc in terms of really is a prospect, is a lead, a customer, is somebody that's gonna to buy tomorrow a customer, is a party that bought a minor product from us over 20 years ago a customer, is a customer just a person or organization or can a bot or automated agent? So very often you have bots buying things on websites, is, are they a customer? 
or is the uh, person or organization associated with the bot a customer? Customers are referred to as buyers sometimes. This gets confused with purchasing buyers or consumers, or is it the state or status of a party? Oh, once they've um, uh, committed to an order, they're a customer, or they're not a customer until they paid for it. Or is an account a customer, but there's a lot of confusion because there's all different accounts. There's a general ledger account. There's a financial account, like a bank account. There's a there's an account as a customer. Are they a role that's played? Are they a business partner? So all this confusion. If they bought from a different enterprise other than ours, are they a customer? Well, they're a customer of somebody else's, but when we say customer, what are we talking about? And by the way, is it not only somebody who's bought, but what if we ship it to someplace? Are they a type of customer, a ship to customer, or an end user customer, or an installation customer, or somebody that is referring the product, or a distribution of our product, are they a customer? Um, so we wanna get clear what exactly, when we say the term customer, very, very important term, what is that with clarity? Now, what we do is often we'll provide um, several tools to help organizations get clarity on these. One tool that we provide that we go into way more detail with in our, uh, like a two-day course we do in Business Glossary, we talk about linguistics. And by the way, in, in one of our classes, one of the people um, from a university, they hired a linguist full-time to say, look, this is extremely important, let's hire a linguist. Well, in linguistics, there's three main branches of linguistics. One is meaning. One is, so what, what's the clarity? And that's just really what we're talking about. And one is form. How do I order my phrases in my definition? Noun, verb, or Norm Chomsky's universal grammar, where there's uh, real important words and then kind of pass through words. Uh, and then context, how do I set up a context? So we're gonna address a lot of these things about linguistics, but right now we're talking about meaning. And there's several sciences in linguistics. One is semantics, really getting to the meaning, and one is etymology, the original meaning of a word. Like for instance, with customer, we, a lot of times we don't think, what is the original meaning of the word customer? Well. This is from Etymology Online. It's pertaining to a custom or customs. It's basically how we deal with a person, how we deal with them. The etymology gives us insight into the definition to say, what is the real essence behind this word? So for instance, we say a customer, and what we do is we have thousands of de definitions we predefine, not to say this is the right definition, it's not the right definition, because there is no such thing as the right definition, but these are useful templates, useful guides uh, that have been through like the quality of 16 different checkpoints on uh, customer definition guidelines. We've talked about that on another webinar. Um, and, and they offer alternatives and possibilities when you're doing a, your own glossary. So you, what you do is you say, oh, let's see how this is done, and then we modify it. So we say, in essence, a customer's a role. It's basically a hat. It's not a, it's a role played by a person or organization. Many definitions say, well, it's a person or, it's not actually a person or organization. It's the hat or the role or the way that a person or organization acts. And this was informed, by the way, by etymology. It's the dealings with the person. It's the role that they played, and by the way, that role could be that they purchased and shipped or used products. And by the way, we're not gonna use the term customer if it's a customer of another organization, because this could lead to that gap that I was talking about in communication. So, this is a template definition that you could use. Now, by the way, a lot of people will use this template and say, you know what, I really like the idea of a business partner. Okay, it's a business partner played by a person or organization or I really like some of the other examples that I gave before, that it's an account or it's the state. 
But what we're doing is offering possibilities for saying, hey, what is your definition instead of starting from scratch, which by the way, I see in so many data governance efforts, like don't start from scratch with these terms or with a taxonomy, and we'll talk about that. So that's the meaning, let's get to the essence. Now, the second part is when we get to the meaning, let's be concise. So here's the definition of customer, a role played by a person in the organization that has purchased and shipped or use products for enterprise prospects are not considered customers, a bot is not considered a customer. And if a bot purchases our products, the customer may be unknown, we'll call, and on and on with examples and things like that. Now, useful information here, but is this the definition? When we're looking at a glossary, especially of thousands of terms, what we wanna do is concisely say the definition so that we don't get caught up in the myriad of details. So we say, this is the definition. And then in the glossary, we can put further description that's useful, further examples that are useful in other places in the glossary. Actually, Jeff is gonna show you a demo where we show in a real life uh, data catalog how this would look. The key point here is to be concise. Concise but complete. Now, let's say we had a definition of customer and we said, well, we wanna also include the idea that it's internal or external consumers, that it's um, employees, department of ours that may deem themselves to purchase goods or services. Should that go in the definition or not? What do you think? Should that go in the definition? I mean, it's important to be complete there, right? Well, the more complete we get with the core definition, the more we kind of get lost in some muck sometimes, but we want to include that. So another way to include it is we say, hey, instead of making this long and hard to follow, let's stick with the essence of what a customer is, and then say, let's add a subterm. Well, there's an internal customer. And by the way, likewise, there's an external customer. The internal customer, a type of customer that's part of our own enterprise. That may include employees or departments of the enterprise. And by the way, one of our 16 guidelines that we use, and I'm gonna give Bob Seiner credit on this, for the cheeseburger definition, we say, if you notice these definitions, we're not defining customer using the term customer, except, except when we have a subterm, because we wanna link it back to the generic term. Uh, uh, so that's one of the key exceptions in a cheeseburger definition. Cheeseburger is saying, hey, I don't define a cheeseburger as a burger with cheese. We want to use other words. Now, another one of those 16 definition guidelines is don't put policies, procedures, or rules into the term definition. So like for store and associate them, these are also important stuff, but another part of the catalog. Here's actually a literal definition from uh, Wikipedia, where we say, a sales order is an order issued by a business, solely to a customer, and so on. And, um, uh, and is an internal document of the company, meaning it's generated by the company itself. Now, by the way, this is the definition, really. Then they're saying that it should record the originating purchase order. That's more like a rule. And then they say, rather than using the customer's purchase order document, an internal form uh, order form allows the internal audit and basically, we're describing a policy uh, of audit control. And then we get back to more rules. Now, these are important things, but this is not a definition. This is a bunch of things. So what you want to do is put the essence, be concise, put the essence of the definition, and then put other things in other places. A type of order. And by the way, the other thing is a sales order is an order. So here you go with a cheeseburger definition, right? issued by a business or sole trader to a customer for products or services, and it's an internal document. Now, nothing against Wikipedia, it's great information, but a sales order is not a document. A sales order is a commitment. It's a, it's a I mean, in the future, we're gonna have things that aren't documents. Even now you have things that aren't documents where it's it, basically what it is, it's a, it's a commitment. So we wanna to get to the essence in a concise way to say, oh, it represents a, commi a commitment from an enterprise's customer to buy something. That's what a sales order is. Now, 
You might have a different definition, but here is a possibility. Third, we want to be consistent. And here's where we really go off the rails, where there's something called ambiguity. We say something like account, and everybody thinks something different. Oh, you mean a portfolio? Oh, you mean a general ledger account? Oh, you mean a bank account? Oh, you mean a financial account? Oh, you mean a customer and account? A phrase that's not explicitly defined, making several different interpretations plausible. This is where we really create this gap Basically, going back to Berlow's model, we say something, it's received completely different. In the glossary, in use of language, ideally our glossary gets to be used in language. Ambi means too, like ambidextrous. So basically what ambiguity is, is this vagueness saying, I can take a word and make it mean multiple things, and that's where we really start losing productivity, and basically, the business glossary is the basis not only for systems, but the way we communicate, the way business communicates. Here's a nice cartoon that illustrates it, the life or death matter, saying, hey, there, would you like to interact with me? Your ambiguity deeply concerns me. <laughs> I would be concerned if I was that little fish with that ambiguity there. Uh, but we do it with our business glossary all the time. Um, so the consistency is really important to say, look, when we say a buyer, what, what is a buyer? Now, uh, when we say consumer, when we say an account, by the way, one way to get around ambiguity is you put a prefix on a lot of these things uh, to say, hey, is it a financial account, not just account? Another is add synonyms and add distinctions between things. When we say a customer, oh, there's an internal and external customer. There's a ship to an end user, a, uh, uh, a bill to customer add distinctions and also put them in context, which is the fourth C. So here you have the classic story about people looking at an elephant. And there's actually an Indian story that many of you probably know that says, hey, there's four blind people that are looking, uh, that are, that are uh, bumping into an elephant. One bumps into uh, the, the trunk. And he says, oh, what's an elephant? And he says, oh, it's like a big vacuum cleaner hose. And one says, no, he bumps into the tail. It's like a, uh, it's like a rope. And another bumps into the side and he says, like a wall. And another bumps into the ear. And he says, no, an elephant is like a big flap. And this is what we often do, especially in glossary efforts. We put in a whole bunch of terms but we don't have a frame of context. We don't have a big picture in mind. What I've noticed in many glossary efforts is they don't use a model or a taxonomy or an ontology. Now, many of you probably do, but I know for a fact, a lot of people don't spend enough time in getting the whole picture put together. Uh, and meaning changes due to context. So very often you might have a prefix that's needed. So when we see account, let's add a prefix to say this is financial services or banking account. And by the way, we're also going to put that in the structure, in the taxonomy, in the hierarchical catalog structure that's in an appropriate place that's easy to find, but that's in context. So very often what I see in glossary efforts is there's all different people working on it. And we're kind of trying to figure out and put all these terms in and get things done. But it's very important to spend time on taxonomy. That's where we can help also. We've spent like decades going through models in all different industries saying, hey, what does the model look like? Well, now we've translated into a, uh, a, a glossary of straight hierarchy. So it's not a data model, it's a hierarchy, a catalog hierarchy. So accounting, there's a section for accounting. So that's where we put in general ledger account. So we know, okay, that's not just an account in general. If we have plan in our healthcare model, there's a place for group insurance plan, what has to do with insurance. And then there's a different place that has to do with the action plan to say, hey, you need to exercise, you need to diet, you need to do other things. But very often people will just say, oh, the plan, or they'll say healthcare plan, and there'll be ambiguity. So one of the things we want to do is we want to provide context, because when you say in healthcare network, 
Are you talking about your telecommunication network? Are you talking about your people network? Uh, put it in context. When we say group, there's an employer group. There's a group that appears on your card itself, which by the way are two distinct entities. Uh, but very often they get confused because there's no context around it. When we say provider, what are we talking about? Oh, well, obviously that's a healthcare provider in healthcare. It's the people that provide the healthcare. But wait a minute, what about the insurance provider? There's all different types of providers. Add context, have this taxonomy. When we say protocol, what is that? This often gets mixed up in different industry models, and I'll actually show you an example of that in a little bit. Uh, the taxonomy provides context. So this is an example of a very small portion of the universal business glossary to say, look, there are things called people and organization. And by the way, in this, you can have person, you can have organization, you can have stuff that applies to both like party information. Uh, you're gonna have, you, you, um, and then there's all different common roles with, by the way, all these have definitions, again, that have been through like these 16 points to make sure that they're right. And there's references to uh, other sources of definitions as well. There's name and all the different types of things that could be associated with names. And then there's customer. And by the way, a lot of times in taxonomies, this name stuff goes in the customer and also goes in the supplier and also goes in employer, and also goes in worker. What we're doing is setting up a taxonomy to say, hey, wherever you have a person name in here, you have these components. So it's not repeated all in dozens of places. So these taxonomies have been carefully thought through. And then there's taxonomies for different industries. So we would uh, have in financial services to say not only these common roles, but retail investment, investor, financial advisors, organization roles like uh, all the specific types of organization roles in financial services and things that could either be a person or an organization. So clients could be a person or an organization, a beneficiary, a trust store with complete definitions on each of these. So um, start with start with taxonomies and then develop your own. By the way, these ideas are just ideas and suggestions for you to develop your own taxonomy that has your own context because it's your own company. Now, people say, well, why don't you just get it from industry models or the dictionary? Uh, in one of the webinars, somebody said, yeah, uh, we gave a challenge to come up with terms and they said, okay, uh, define protocol. And they said, they love this source. It happens to come from a clinical trial protocol to say, wow, uh, this source basically says, look, uh, here's an industry definition a document that describes the objectives, design, methodology, statistical considerations, and organization of a trial. The protocol usually also gives the background and rationale for the trial, but these could be provided in other reference documents. Throughout the ICH GCP guideline, the term protocol refers to protocol and protocol amendments. So before I go any further, what do you guys think of this definition? Feel free to chat in or um, or just just mull it over, see what you think. Um, any any issues with this definition that you can see? Maybe we go through the four C's. Um, if you look at the definition, you say clear. Is this clear? This has the same issue as the order, uh, as the sales order. Is a protocol a document? What if the protocol isn't a document at all? What if it's electronic? It, it, is a protocol a document? Or is it a course of action, a, a suggested course of action, the way things are done? Uh, what if it's not a document at all? What if it's uh, um, a video? What if, uh, a, a document is one of the ways that we're communicating the protocol, but a protocol is not a document. So this leads to lack of clarity. It seems okay, but now, by the way, is objectives, um, is the, is, are the objectives of the protocol, is the protocol describing the objectives or the course of action? So that's not, that may not be clear either. Like the um, protocol is describing the course of action. There's other things that describe objectives. 
And by the way, we're talking about things like protocol amendments. And here we're putting in additional stuff in the actual definition that's not concise, that's not really about what a protocol really is. And also, by the way, what this is describing is a clinical trial protocol. A protocol could be used for a lot of things. So a protocol, one definition that we use, a standard course of action to be adopted by people working within a particular organization, profession, or service. So basically the protocol for a clinical trial, the protocol for onboarding, the protocol for healthcare treatment, the protocol for telecommunications, the protocol for this webinar, the protocol for anything. So we wanna have a general term and a specific term and put it in context. That's where a lot of business glossaries go, go, go off, the, off the track. Now, uh, before I go into poll two, um, I'm not seeing the chat. Does anybody, uh, uh, Robert and uh, and Jeff, can you um, can you let me know? Are there any questions in the chat? Yes, that? there there are uh, several uh, questions. Len, do you want to maybe look at them at the end of the call, or do you want to address a couple of them now? Uh, I'll uh, I'll follow your cue, Robert. What do you think? Uh, well, we'll take a couple of minutes. Let me start with the first one from Mark. Uh, okay. So some items critical to the business suffer from consistency, but other business terms that are less critical are better defined. He's ma making more of a statement, it's a little bit weird. Uh, he then goes on and says, does, does this imply the use of superclass slash subclass, starting off with a very general meaning, meaning of a customer? And that was from Peter. Yeah. Great. So... Um... I think it's really important. We're looking at thousands of definitions, but some definitions are much more important. I think this is what you're talking about in terms of prioritizing, uh, that there's key things. Um, what is a customer? What's a product? What's an invoice? What's an order? An invoice is a request for payment. An order is a commitment. Get these core um, these core concepts. A ship, what's a shipment? It's a movement of something. Get the core clarity there. And yes, spend more time on some of the items than others. There was a, um, um, a Sally May project, uh, Sally May project, where they had the seven elements project. They had a huge return on investment because they said these are the seven elements that are really important to define well. Um, second, of uh, super terms and subterms, yes, very very important for consistency to make sure that you get the um, uh, the consistency by using subterms and yes, start with the generic. By the way, sometimes I would start with the specific and then go up to the general term. So I hope that answered some of that. Yeah, and Len, we'll deal with this one, then we'll go to Paul and then we'll transfer over to Jeff. But uh, this is one is from Divi. Hey Len, what are your thoughts in modeling your taxonomy or hierarchy, mimic mimicking customer's journey in brackets in customer success organizations or banking or healthcare? Curious to get your thoughts. Okay, so the way I think the way I'm understanding that, and here's where we have communication. Also, we have all these words. But uh, are you saying modeling the taxonomy to so say we have a model and then we have a taxonomy? That's modeling the way your I'm taxonomy understanding. Taxonomy or hierarchy, mimicking, mimicking customers' journey. Yeah, absolutely, and that's actually what we've done. We have a, a model, a, a universal data model. So we have these data models that show the customer's journey. So there's a customer model that's showing all the different relationships. There's a model for the customer. And then we have a taxonomy and we map the two of them to each other. So like um, when we jumpstart these efforts, people can get the data dictionary, which comes with a model, a data model. And then we can import those into like uh, the data dictionary part of the catalog. And then we can also import the taxonomy with the definitions and show one in terms of a taxonomy, one in terms of a model, I think it's critical. Now, I'm talking about a data model. There's also other models. You could use process models, uh, ontology models, um, uh, all sorts of other models. But however you do it, yes, we model for understanding. And then also another type of model is a taxonomy. That is a type of model. But absolutely, have, uh, have both of these types of models. Great question, Debbie. And uh, and by the way, I think a lot of data glossary efforts don't do that, but it, it's really important. By the way, when you do it from a business glossary, there's a way to do a, what I call business data model. So um, 
Uh, so we'll go ahead. Uh, that's and actually the, uh, the the second poll here, uh, Len. Just the right. if we can do that. Uh, yeah. So this is kind of just some feedback uh, based upon what we said of these four C's: clarity, concise, consistency, and context. Does these make sense? Uh, would you use these four C's? Yes, no, in your glossary effort. Would you really base your glossary effort and use these? Or uh, uh, six, I'm not involved in it. I wanted you to uh, take over the screen from here, Robert. Yeah, I'm just uh, looking at the uh, the final numbers, letting them settle down. We're getting some interesting feedback. So let me go ahead and... Uh share uh just look uh, yep they've pretty much uh, settled down so let me go ahead and share uh this uh and uh, here here's the feedback uh len and jeff and just before I transfer it over to jeff and uh, maybe we'd get your uh thoughts on uh, this uh len and, and jeff well it's definitely very interesting to see that in the no category is zero percent uh, I'm very uh, <laughs> encouraged good. by the amount of yeses. Yeah, good, good. good. Uh, that's really the feedback we were looking for to say, yeah, you, you, we, we hope that you could apply this and use it. And by the way, if you do apply this and there are some insights, we'd love to hear from you and say, hey, how, how did this help? Our whole goal here is to say, how can we be of service? So good. Thanks, Lynn. And just while I make uh, Jeff the uh, presenter, uh, if there is a, a questions uh, box on the uh, right-hand side on dialog panel. If you want to put your questions in there, we will try and get uh, another Q&A at the end of the uh, presentation as well. So, uh, Jeff, I believe we have transferred control to you. Yes, you just have to exit out of the poll, Robert, and then I'll be able to see that. Yes, thank you. Hide that poll. There we go. Try that. All right, hang on one sec here. You might want to send it to me again because I'm not seeing the little acceptance screen yet. It says your presenter. Uh, sorry, uh, make Jeff presenter. Try it now. There we go. We can see your screen. You want to go full screen on your presentation mode? There we go. Now, Jeff, can we hear you? Uh, try speaking now. Jeff? Testing one, two, three. There we go. You're coming through now right. loud and clear. I think yours, uh, it had accidentally muted you. So we can hear you. We can see your screen. Okay. Now that we have all the uh, technical things out of the way, I'm going to talk about technology. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm going to talk about it is in the, the scope of how technology can help support the ideas and concepts that uh, Len just talked about. So just a quick recap on some of the things that uh, that Len discussed. Firstly, a uh, certain consistency around your definitions, having a certain set of guidelines that'll help you construct a decent definition. Uh, some standardization uh, around the definitions so that they'll apply across uh, across the enterprise and uh, the idea that there are industry standard definitions which might be different depending on whether you're talking about insurance or healthcare or finance and things like that. And this idea that a business glossary itself is truly independent of technology. So everything really discussed here has to do with the idea that you have to think about this before you go out and acquire some kind of a, of a tool because Often people will just go out and buy a tool and make the assumption, hey, I just bought a tool, therefore we have a glossary, but that's not really the case. It's like saying I just went out and bought a baby grand piano, so now I'm ready for Carnegie Hall. So the idea that uh, technology does help support it, but it isn't in fact the glossary itself. So looking at the glossary from a content perspective, this is where uh, we're talking about universal business glossary here. So 
what you probably got from what Len was talking about is that there's a fair amount of investment of time and effort in just getting a business glossary off the ground. So what this does is it really helps to shorten the time and effort required to get your business glossary established. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, this concept of a universal business glossary. And the software I'm going to be using is Irwin's Data Intelligence Suite. However, if you have Calibra or you have Alation or some other technology, that's okay because this is applicable in any technology that you uh, might want to, to work with. So let's take a look at the first concept that, uh, that we're looking at here in the four C's. And that's the whole idea of clear or clarity. Uh, so the idea here is that what we're looking at is this idea that um, it's understanding a business term's meaning. So Len mentioned several different roles that can be played by a customer. So how does a uh, cataloging tool help us with that? So let me just jump on over real quick. And I have to log in here, I think. So I've been sitting out here for a little while. My system may have gone to sleep. <clears throat> so let's just take a look at this idea here. I'm just gonna go search on this customer idea. And you can see here that we have uh, this idea of a customer. So the idea that we're looking for here is, what is the, the, the different contexts or uh, roles that a customer can can actually play. So if I drill into this and I start looking at the associations, what we can see here is that there's the ability to associate a term with a business policy, a business rule, other business terms, and then some technology assets. But here, if I look at the business term, we can see here clearly all in one screen that there's an idea of a bill to customer, an end user customer, a ship to customer. And notice that in the definitions, we're able to use the word customer in the definition because we've already defined what a customer is from a general perspective. So I think somebody had the question about super types and subtypes. So this is really just an example of that in the technology where we can say, okay, yes, we've already defined in generalities what a customer is. Now let's get down to the specifics of what we're talking about here when we're talking about a customer. So let me jump back over into my uh, slide deck here and talk about concise. So when we're talking about concise, we're talking about understanding the term meaning um, and the ability to be brief. So Len showed a couple of examples where there was a, a business term and embedded into the business term were some business rules, some policies, uh, examples, extraneous other information, uh, some of which might be germane, others which might not. So here's how we would look at that in terms of, uh, of a uh, business glossary data catalog. So again, <clears throat> I'll go and look at my customer here. And then when I click on customer, <clears throat> we have the definition of the customer. So if we look over here, you can see that the definition itself is just the brief, and usually you try to keep it to a single sentence, if at all possible, that describes the essence of what it is. However, there are descriptions and examples. These are all useful to help us further understand what we mean when we're talking about customers. So if I start to read this through here, then I can talk about customers that uh, may have purchased something or uh, may have been shipped something. So then that gives me an idea that perhaps maybe um, there are other uh, meanings around this context of customer. So that's the idea uh, that we're talking about here is that there are different placeholders where we can put additional information. I can also put external references to websites. So if you got a definition from, let's say, Merriam-Webster, and you want to point to that, or in your descriptions, you have a reference to, let's say, an ISO standard that 
uh, is applicable. You can also embed those URLs in here as well so that they are additional information about what it is you're talking about. Let me just pop out here. And let's go back into this and talk about consistency. So when we're talking about consistency, what we're really talking about here is just doing the same things in a same manner over and over again. But you can also look at consistency in terms of a kind of structure that I understand that's consistent. So when I'm looking for some information, I can find it uh, quickly. So let's take a look at that. If you look over here on the left hand side i've got this business terms folder and then underneath this i have several other folders so i might have a folder around uh, financial services which might have some terms around that manufacturing i might have terms around that this one here is general business which is applicable for most organizations and if i expand it you can see i've got folders that pertain to accounting and invoicing and orders these are things that all uh, companies have in one form or another. But I can drill into something like, let's say, people and organizations. And if I want to, I can also show, let's give me some more room here. <clears throat> we can see that we have communications events, we've got organizations, we have parties. So if I look at a party, then I can see that we have customer roles, we have general roles, party types. Then if I expand into the customer role, then I'll be able to see that, okay, this is where we have build to customers, customers, end user customers, ship to customers. So the idea here is what we're doing is we're navigating down some kind of a funnel until we get to that specific area where I can find the information that I'm looking for. And so this is what Len was talking about with having a taxonomy or structure. So this is one that comes from the general business area within the universal business glossary. It's organized in such a way that you can uh, drive through to it. However, you can customize any of this stuff uh, to meet what you want. So if you want to say do a customer journey approach, certainly you could uh, handle that through modification of the structure and uh, make it applicable for that context. So let's come back out here and talk about context. Okay, so that's a great segue into the next section here. So context, as Robert said, is everything, because context is that part that gets most people confused. Quite often you'll be talking to somebody and they'll be telling you about, something on a report or a form or something, and you'll be trying to figure out, what are they talking about? I don't fully understand what it is they're talking about. I know they're talking about customers, but why are they talking about people who got the bill? I don't, I don't refer to that as being a customer. I only refer to customers as people who bought something from us. So that's us not fully understanding the full context as to what a customer it is, or a product is, or a policy is, or a financial instrument is. So this is where we want to do something about what they call lineage. So let's just jump into the tool and talk about that for a quick sec. So you see here, I've got my customer. And what I really want to do is I want to fully understand the full scope of customer when I'm trying to evaluate something. So if I click on a, um, a button here, which will expand it, what we can see here is that this thing called customer is right here in the middle. That's our object of interest. Everything over here on the left-hand side is a technology specific reference. And everything over here on the right-hand side is a business or business term perspective. So if I'm looking at the business term perspective, I could see that customer itself has a business term, a business rule, and a business policy associated with it. So when Len was talking about this uh, notion of a sales order having a business rule and a business policy embedded in it, the data catalog actually has places for you to put the business rules and the business policies that affect or govern something. 
But if I follow along the business term out to the end, I can find that a business term following the taxonomy in the general business under people and organizations that there's this concept of a party. And within a party, I can have a customer role and the customer role can be a ship to, build to, or end user customer. So that's my full understanding of a customer in various contexts. On the other side is, well, where can I find it? I want to put it on a report so I can run some uh, analytics on it, but I don't know where to even go to get it. So over here, I've got to the uh, table level. Um, here is the environment level and the system level. So customer information at a system level is kept in the customer management system, right? So I might have a you know CRM or something like that. And then deep within that, there is a set of information called customer data. This may be a set of tables or some logical representation. And then these things here, COM10, header, and retail10 are all the tables that contain customer information that I might want on my report. So the scope and context is displayed before me here in a single diagram. So let's go back out here. And at this point, I'm just going to hand it back to Robert uh, to finish up. Thanks, uh, Jeff, and uh, thanks, Len. And again, uh, we'll just go into wrap-up mode, see if we've got a, uh, some time left for a few more questions. Uh, hopefully, if we've done our job correctly, uh, and as evident by the last poll we did, looks like we have, uh, everyone hopefully has a, got a, a better understanding of the four C's of effective communication, clear, concise, consistent, and context. Uh, and we hope that we're, uh, we have shown you how leveraging content with Universal Business Glossary, management of that content and the technology, that it is possible to achieve effective communication. Uh, Jeff, go ahead and go to the next slide. So how can we help you on uh, your journey? Uh, first, uh, you may have mentioned, uh, you may have heard Len mention that uh, there is a, a Universal Business Glossary workshop. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, we do offer that uh, today. Very comprehensive business glossary workshop. Uh, yes, in today's environment, it can be delivered remotely. And it provides a proven yet effective approach to developing a shared, accepted, and very useful business glossary. Jeff, next slide. Uh, Jeff also mentioned, uh, and you saw it in the technology that he was demonstrating, that we can provide a jumpstart uh, in the way of a universal business glossary that provides uh, thousands of well-defined business terms and definitions that can greatly reduce the time spent on creating and or developing a business glossary. And Jeff, you go to the next slide. Um, Santel can also, uh, in combination with uh, Len, as we're partnering with Len, uh, provide the uh, data catalog offering that you saw um, uh, Jeff use there uh, by the Irwin uh, Data Intelligence Suite. Uh, it uh, handles much more than just a business glossary, but we wanted to show just the business glossary functionality uh, uh, in this particular presentation and how it can help in the management of your universal business glossary or business glossary terms, rules, and, and so much more. So with that, uh, Jeff, if you can just go to the next slide. Um, we're going to open up into uh, some questions. I'm going to look at the questions that were answered there. Uh, but first, we'd like to thank you for your interaction. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Um, please feel free to reach out to me uh, on the email here. Uh, robert.lutton.sandhillconsultants.com or my phone number. Uh, if you're, uh, and that phone number is incorrect there. <laughs> it should be 5882. Uh, my apologies. Uh, but um, if you'd like to reach out to us on that, 905-847-5882. Uh, uh, but with that, I'm going to open up into uh, questions uh, in the last uh, few remaining uh, time we've got, last couple of minutes. Uh, so, Len, and, uh, and thank you, Jeff, for changing that on the fly. Uh, so, Len and Jeff, uh, just quickly, how does uh, this approach define a temporal context? Can you guys talk to that? Hmm. Yeah. So, one of the areas in general business 
is that there's actually a catalog uh, concept called uh, called time, and you have concepts like standard time period, like months or standard years or standard fiscal periods. Uh, you have from and through dates. Um, you have um, uh, uh, um, days of the week that, uh, and, and so basically that's one way that we do it. Another way that we do it is in key elements, we'll actually define, okay, here's an assessment. When was the assessment from and through and who was involved and when did they get involved from and through? So when appropriate, we're putting in the temporal cons constructs as terms. Uh, in the glossary. By the way, this is distinguished from the model, which are often stored in um, uh, a little bit more technical format in status types, but in the glossary, they're, they're also linked to status types, but a little bit less technical and business oriented to store temporal concepts. Uh, thank you, Len. And, and Peter and uh, the uh, Hans and uh, uh, Robin and Karen and Carl, uh, we'd like to just thank you for your input. I can see the questions going back and forth. Uh, this here one uh, come up, uh, Jeff, this might be an interesting one. Does any of this communication clarification work, i.e. glossary, deal with the messy language buried inside software applications? And we'll make that our last one uh, question for the day, uh, Jeff. Um, yeah, it does because um, as Len mentioned, what you do is you find a source. So like Len used the Wikipedia source for the uh, sales order definition. This could come from, um, you know, a stored procedure within a database or something. Um, you have to convert it into something that gets you to the to a level where the business people can understand it because Obviously, the business glossary needs to be uh, focused for business people. So some abstraction of, of things will have to happen um, before you can include it in the, in the business glossary. Um, but there's nothing in here specifically that talks about uh, a store procedure or some sort of uh, buried um, technology code. There's another aspect of that as well, Jeff, which is the business industry can help drive future systems. Sure, so absolutely. Clarity by using the business industry to help inform these systems so future generations of these systems are clearer. Right, especially when you start looking at these things and finding out the rules versus the term, right? Because when you think about a term, it is essentially a concrete noun idea. But when you start saying uh, things about process and behavior and performance, well, now that goes into the rules category, and then the rules basically get codified in some sort of software product to enforce the rules. So the idea here is, even as I showed sort of in the uh, in the in the catalog areas, that you know you have the the ability to go in and say, okay, what technology asset actually is uh, is controlling this thing? So, as Len mentioned, it does help uh, in trying to define uh, existing or to be future systems. Uh, Len and uh, Jeff, I could keep you here another five or ten minutes with the questions coming in. Let me just say to our audience that we have the questions there. Uh, we will make sure the questions are included in the uh, communication we send out to everyone. This presentation has been recorded. Uh, we will uh, load up the recording and put it to our YouTube uh, channel. And uh, we hope that you will uh, stay in touch with us. And uh, we look forward to helping you out in any way possible. And my thanks to Len and Jeff for their time today. Thank you. Thank you for tuning Thank you. in.